Good evening. I am Brooke Clement, Director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum, and I want to thank you all for joining us tonight as we commemorate the 50th anniversary of Watergate. Over the next two days, we will be hearing from historians and their perspectives of those events that took place in 1972. And those events would have a tremendous impact on a congressman from, from Grand Rapids, the man for whom this building is named. I invite you to explore our exhibits, both in Grand Rapids and online, to learn more about our holdings. And now onto our program, I'd like to invite Gleaves Whitney, Executive Director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation to introduce tonight's speaker. Brooke. Thank you so much, Brooke. Appreciate it. Um, I believe we're getting an echo. Should I turn off the? Okay, I'm good. All right. Very good. Well, Brooke, again, thank you for a, an introduction that sets the stage. And I want to say good evening to you all, whether you're here in person or you're watching uh, through Zoom. We appreciate your watching online. And I want to welcome you to part two of Watergate. This program is a continuation now of what was happening in part one earlier this afternoon. Some of you caught the, the movie, All the President's Men, perhaps, and I think it is a great period piece, but it's also aged well, just like Robert Redford, right? <laughs> well, literally in about six hours, six hours from now, we're going to be marking the 50th anniversary of when uh, that group of five were involved in a now very famous burglary, a break-in. And I think it's gonna be uh, you know, interesting for us to think about all the consequences going into the DNC headquarters at the Watergate complex there on the right bank of the Potomac River would have subsequently on American history. And we've brought somebody in who's going to be able to, to talk about that at some length. Dr. Tevi Troy, I'm going to be introducing uh, more formally in just a minute, but uh, and the impact the scandal has had. But uh, first, I just want to say a few things about a program like this. No, no program like this can happen without the hard work, the vision of a lot of people. And so this is the time when I like to say thank you to you, first of all, our friends of Ford who come out and been loyal year in and year out. Thank you so much for, for being here and continuing through the past couple of years where we've had the ups and downs of the pandemic and here you sit, so I so appreciate you being here. We could not have these excellent programs without you. And I'd also like to thank members of the Ford family for being here. We've got uh, Bob and Karen at Ford. Thank you so much uh, for your steadfast attendance at these events. It means so much to us that the Ford family comes to these events in, in this temple of democracy uh, named for you know, your very famous uh, ancestor. And then um, we have uh, a judge, Judge Lieber, who's in the audience. Thank you for being here. We really appreciate your abiding support as well. Uh, we have trustees or former trustees, Marty Allen and David Fry, who's here with his wife, Judy. And yes, there's, there's Dave right there in the second row. And I think we also have John Babb, who's here with his wife, Janet. We so appreciate the support of our trustees and our former trustees. I mean, this is a fantastic board. The former trustees continue to be so supportive of, of what we do around here, and it shows their dedication. And then we have our wonderful partners, of course, on the other side of what, what I call our good neighbor fence at the foundation. We have our wonderful partners at the, at the Ford Presidential uh, library and museum, Brooke and Joel and their team, Kristen, there's Morell, all of you all just do such a great job and, and we couldn't do the good work we do without you. And then of course, uh, I have a team there at the foundation I'm very proud of. Uh, a special shout out to, to Lauren and then we've got uh, Abby in the back there and Amy and Rachel, all of you just do a terrific job of making these programs come off without a hitch. Let's give them all a hand. So here we are, part two. You know, part one was the movie, part two now, we're gonna have a real engagement in this whole idea of Watergate with uh, a, a great speaker. Watergate, 50 years later. Why is that significant? It's significant, first of all, that you're here to participate in this because you're the ones who understand the consequences of civic service done right, as in Ford's example, and when 
civil service, civic service goes wrong in the case of a former president. So, you know, you, by being here, continue to participate in the virtues and the values of the Fords. We're building a community by your being here. Second, it's significant because we have the opportunity uh, to contemplate, really, what would the life of President and Mrs. Ford been like had there not been a Watergate? Think of what the country would have missed if we had not had their example of integrity, of integrity at the helm for the 895 days that he was in office. His example endures to this day and is so important to us. So it's our, the Catholics call these things a Felix culpa. You know, the fact that uh, you had a, a, a prior president fall gave rise to a great, great man becoming president and a fantastic first lady. People we would not have gotten to know as Americans. So we appreciate that, it's significant. And it's also significant because we have invited a, a very distinguished speaker to be part of this evening's uh, uh, conversation, Dr. Tevi Troy. And uh, he promises to deepen our insights into one of the defining moments in our nation's more recent history. And uh, let's, let's talk a little bit now uh, about Tevi. I mean, you've probably already read much about his background. Uh, he's uh, distinguished in so many ways. And, you know, you see it in the ads and the marketing material, but someone as accomplished as Tevi doesn't need any padding in an introduction. Let me just say he was a top aide to President George W. Bush, confirmed by the U.S. Senate, which makes him the honorable Tevi Troy. I learned that from Tevi earlier today. If you're confirmed by the Senate, you have that title for life where he is the honorable. Uh, he's also a presidential historian who's written a number of highly regarded books, four or five books at this point, and he's starting to work on another. Uh, these books on the, the presidency are wonderfully insightful. He's a great raconteur. I've enjoyed hanging with him all day long because of the stories and things that I've learned about the presidency that I did not know previously. And this most recent book, Fight House, is one that we're going to be talking about today, and he'll have the uh, opportunity to sign the, the copies of the book that you purchase later tonight. It's not too early to purchase Christmas presents, you know. And then we've got um, his, his work, his current work as a senior fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, D.C., a group that the foundation has partnered with, and I can tell you it's a first-rate group which is trying to overcome the sclerosis and the dysfunction, the hyper-partisanship in American political life today. It's really important that they're their work with people like Tevi on Troy, do the work they do to try to heal, mend, pull this country back together. They have a lot of innovative programs. Tevi's right at the top of the innovation with uh, leadership programs for corporations and for other organizations that need it, engage citizenship. You know, Tevi is in rare company. I mean, I was starting to think, how many authors do we have who served at a very high level as an aide to a president who's also a PhD presidential historian. It's a man who got his bachelor's degree at Cornell and then he went on to the University of Texas, very fine program there where he got his PhD in American Studies, American Civilization. And so he has the chops uh, to be a scholar, but he's also had that experience within an administration. Well, there are not very many people who could ever say that. Arthur Schlesinger comes to mind. We talked about him earlier, Doris Kearns Goodwin and Tevi Troy. So you can read more details in uh, Tevi's storied biography uh, online and in your program. But you know what I want to do right now is just emphasize something about Tevi's spirit that came out today. Uh, you always want to get to know the speaker at a different level from just what's on the resume. And I have to tell you, when I was taking him around the grounds and we went over to the grave site, you know, just over here, um, Tevi was very moved because I told him the story that comes from page 10 from A Time to Heal. And I hope you will indulge me and let me read you a short passage that very much moved me when I first encountered it and it moved Tevi today. And let me just read what uh, President Ford in his own words said after he had had the call from Al Haig, General Haig, and he now President Ford, uh, you know, Vice President Ford and uh, Mrs. Ford knew that their lives we're about to change in the country too, forever. It's about 1.30 in the morning. They hang up. It's almost 1.30 in time to go to bed, writes President Ford. We entered our bedroom, undressed, snapped off the light, and as we lay there in the darkness, our hands reached out and touched 
simultaneously with either of us having said a word. Then we began to pray. God, give us strength, give us wisdom, give us guidance as the possibility of a new life confronts us. We promise to do our very best, whatever may take place. You have sustained us in the past. We have faith in your guiding hand in the difficult and challenging days ahead. And he says, as President Ford says, I concluded with a prayer from the fifth and sixth verses of chapter three in the book of Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And then they went to sleep. And then they got up. And the history we're going to talk about today started. So with that, I would like to invite Tevi Troy to come join me, please, on stage. Help welcome him. Where would you like to sit? Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Have a seat. Well, first of all, thank you for coming. This is your first visit to Grand Rapids, I believe. Really? It's and been a great visit. Really happy that you're here. Uh, I've learned so much just walking around today with you. And I, I think the way that we should start is, first of all, is, you know, uh, the teacher in me, I always want us to define our terms. What was Watergate in 1972 to 1974? An excellent question. Uh, I had a nice reminder of it when I went to the program and I did see the All the President's Men uh, movie this afternoon, which, by the way, was the first movie that was shown to Jimmy Carter when he was in the White House, which I always found interesting because the movie that more than anything else led to Carter becoming president is the first movie. So, and by the way, Carter saw 480 movies in one term as president. It's a presidential <laughs> record. He really liked his movies. Uh, but Watergate is, as uh, was, it was famously dismissed as a, it was a third rate burglary by a bunch of bunglers. And Garrett Graff is here and uh, he's an old friend and uh, editor of mine, Washingtonian. And you should all read his book on, on Watergate. But it, it's, it seems pretty clear to me from the historical record that Nixon did not direct, direct this burglary. He didn't say go burgle the, uh, the Democratic headquarters, but he did create this unit, the plumbers, because he was so obsessed with leaks and so worried about leaks. And that's why they're called the plumbers, because they plug <laughs> leaks. And so this relatively minor burglary by a bunch of bungling fools, really, who I, th I think is, is my historical analysis, is they were just trying to prove their worth. They, they, you didn't really need to burgle the Democratic National Committee headquarters to win that election that Nixon won with 49 states and almost 60% of the vote. You didn't need it. Nixon was going to win in a landslide over the government. But there were, there were these plumbers, and they were supposed to justify their existence. And this is one of the things they did. And it was, it was, a, it was a stupid um, and bad thing they did. But the, Nixon's problem is that he couldn't let it go. And he couldn't just own up and say, these people, they had an association with me. They were wrong. I denounce it, I criticize them. Uh, he just couldn't do it. And the cover up begins. And the famous phrase that still exists is the cover up is worse than the crime. And Nixon, who wanted to have one of the most secretive administrations in history, he really tried to control information, he tried to get rid of leaks. He ended up, because of Watergate, you had the revelation of his tapes. And the tapes come out, and suddenly the American people have this very different picture of this man, suddenly this profane man who says anti-Semitic things, who um, is rude and gruff and uh, is just a, a problematic person. And the, the tapes reveal a, a Nixon that the American people is not the person that the American people voted for in overwhelming numbers in 1972. So this whole thing cascades in a way that makes Nixon look worse and worse. And Interestingly, in comparison today, I know there's a lot of people who do these uh, comparisons between Trump today and, and Nixon, and I, I don't think it's a great comparison. But what you do see in those Watergate hearings is that there was a bipartisan effort to get at the truth. Both parties were trying to get it. And the famous, famous phrase of the Watergate hearings, which is, what did the president know and when did he know it, is asked by the Republican on the committee, by Howard Baker, because the information that behind it was discovered by the Republicans, including Fred Dalton Thompson, who was um, Baker's, uh, one of Baker's lawyers. And the Democrats gave that opportunity 
to Baker because his, his team had found it. There was a cooperation there. And then you have George H.W. Bush, who is the head of the Republican National Committee during Watergate, meaning he's defending Nixon all throughout Watergate at great potential peril to his future political hopes. And a few days before Nixon resigns, a day before Nixon resigns, he actually sends a letter as head of the RNC telling Nixon that he should resign and in, in doing so basically salvaging his political career. So Watergate is this thing that starts small, cascades, gets bigger, takes down a presidency, leads to the presidency of Gerald Ford, the person who we uh, honor with this great temple to democracy. And, and then it becomes part of the American legacy. And now 50 years later, we're still dealing in Watergate. This room is filled with people who are interested in Watergate. In the article that I just wrote in the Washington Examiner on the subject, which I know wants to discuss, I talk about the legacy of Watergate across every subsequent presidency. It's not something that goes away. So again, something that smart, starts small and really cascades out of control, and that's where we are now. Well, and that leads to my second question. So that's a good definition of Watergate, you know, from June 17th, 1972, you know, to say August 9th, 1974, but in subsequent years, generations, you know, administrations, it takes on new shades of meaning. Every gate out there traces back to Watergate. So has, has the definite, the essential definition of Watergate changed over these last 50 years? Yes and no, I and mean, there's two meanings to Watergate. One is the specific narrow scandal that took place at the Democratic National Committee headquarters that led to the, uh, the, the downfall of Richard Nixon. But then there's Watergate, which is the whole idea, the idea that presidents can act in bad ways and the system can respond against them and investigations can lead to significant consequences with geopolitical effects. And so Watergate has just become, it's part of the American lexicon in a way that's just more than the scandal itself. It is part of the way we look at politics today. And Gleaves and I were talking about this earlier, that there is a sense today of the criminalization of political differences. There's a sense that if your opponent is in office and they're doing something you don't like on policy grounds, they don't agree with you on policy, you will go after them with whatever means, whether it's the special investigators of the Justice Department or uh, congressional committees, not to stop their policies, but to stop them. And I think Watergate kind of opened up the possibility that that could, is something that could happen to all future politicians. Watergate hangs so heavily over us over these past decades because there's an immediacy. We have it within our living memory for those of us who are old enough. But let's be good historians here. Let's try to rank. And in fact, it was Nixon who said it takes 50 years to judge the place of an event or a person in history. That was his rule of thumb. And, and Nixon, you know, was a, he wrote some interesting biographies of world leaders. So if that's the rule of thumb, I guess I would ask you where when you think of all the American scandals in the presidency, you know, whether it's, you know, relatively minor things like the midnight appointments of John Adams or, you know, uh, Teapot Dr. Dome Rapp. or, you know, you, you've got these other scandals that have come about it right here in Grand Rapids, for example. I know from Ralph Hallenstein telling me who was at the Grand Rapids Herald, FDR sent G-men from the FBI to come to do research on Vandenberg who he thought was gonna run for president. Well, this is using the federal government in an illegal way to go after one's opponents. Even FDR was doing this. So we know that things happen. We know that Johnson, for example, from the Pentagon Papers, talking about a scandal, we know that our presidents were lying to us about Vietnam, blatantly lying. So how bad really is Watergate? So you asked me to judge Watergate kind of in historical terms, and it reminds me of the famous story when Kissinger is on the trip to China and he's talking to Chu Enlai and asks Chu Enlai for his assessment of the impact of the French Revolution, which obviously happens in the you know, early 19th century. And uh, Chu Enlai supposedly says to Kissinger, too soon to tell, right? Which means, <laughs> you know, 200 years later, it's still too soon to tell. So it, it, in some ways it's hard to say. Um, I don't think Watergate is the worst thing a president has ever done. I really don't. But do I think it's the most iconic American scandal and will continue to be for a long time? Yes, I, I think it will. Very interesting nuance. Did our system work through the process? There obviously was some breakdown. 
at the very least in ethics, but did the system, did our institutions work through Watergate and the, the investigation and uh, through the pardon and the fallout? It's a really good question because as, as you suggested, there were things that uh, Kennedy and Johnson were doing that were similar to Watergate. Of course, they didn't have the problem of the cover-up, which I think were, were some things. Uh, so maybe the system had room for some presidential misdeeds and not others, but once this started to become public and cascade, something had to be done. And I think that the system that the founders set up with impeachment as the way to correct or, uh, or, or uh, punish a president who had done something wrong, I think the system worked. But perhaps in a way that has led to some problematic lessons, because today, first of all, Nixon was never actually impeached, as we all know. He was about to be impeached when he resigned. But impeachment had really only been attempted once before against Andrew Johnson in the 1860s. And then in the 1970s, it's brought forth against Nixon, it doesn't actually happen, but he resigns. And so that's twice in the first 200 years of the nation. And then three subsequent times, we've had impeachment proceedings since then in the last 50 years. And so it almost makes me worry that it's too much of a go-to move by Congress. And you hear this talk that uh, if the Republicans win Congress in, um, in, in this, the November elections, they'll want to impeach Biden about a whole host of things, which I think would be a terrible and disastrous idea. And, and it gets into that issue that I talked about of the criminalization of political differences. You may not like Biden's policies, but it's not impeachable to have bad policies. And so I do worry that impeachment is a tool that loses its value. And when it loses its value, then you have a situation like we've had in the last three impeachments where it's basically a partisan endeavor. And since you need two thirds of the Senate to convict, if you have one party against the process and one party for it, you're never gonna have a conviction, which means impeachment is more of a symbolic act or black mark against the president than it is an actual tool for removing the president when there's serious malfeasance. Hey, let's move into the Ford presidency itself then. You said something earlier today that I noted. I wrote it down because it was such a concise and wonderful formulation. You said- Leaves was taking notes on me all day. It was very disconcerting. That's right. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I'm forever the student. Um, but when we were talking about the impact on the Ford presidency, you said it was politically suicidal, but ethically and prudentially necessary. What a wonderful formulation. Talk about that. So the, the formulation is specifically related to the pardon, the decision to pardon Nixon, which Ford makes very early on in the administration. And at, with disagreement within the administration and a great personal and political cost. You know, Bob Hartman, who I, I saw his picture up on the library when I was going through the museum earlier today, he was one of Ford's closest aides, uh, but was also a somewhat problematic and sharp elbowed figure within the administration. We can talk about that, but Hartman, was personally very close to Ford and had Ford's interests in mind, even if I don't necessarily agree with all of the tactics he engaged in the White House. And he strenuously objected to this decision to pardon Nixon, and he pushed against it when he could. And then when he realized it was gonna happen anyway, he said, why now? Why not a month from now? Why not wait till Christmas? He didn't see the necessity of doing this immediate pardon because doing the pardon that quickly raised the specter of a deal, of a tit for tat, of a sense that, oh, well, Ford, you will pardon me, I will resign and you will pardon me and I, you'll get to be president and I'll get my pardon. And that is not what happened and there was no deal, but Hartman was appropriately worried about that perception and that perception hurting Ford. And also just the sense that Nixon had done these terrible things, he'd been exposed in really bad ways. And doing the act of pardoning him was not popular and it hurt Ford. And I think there's a very good case to be made that Ford loses that 1976 election to Carter, which is an incredibly close election. And Ford, Ford had momentum towards the end. He was getting closer and closer to Carter as the election 
um, we got closer and you know some of the Ford's aides would, aides would grumble later, well, if the election was two weeks later, we would have won, or if the election was four weeks later, we won. Well, you know what? The election is on the second Tuesday in November, and that's when the election is. So it doesn't matter if you would have won it in 1977 or 78 or 79. The election is when the election happened. But Ford is not ignorant. He knows. He knows that what he does has severe political consequences for him. But it was the right thing to do for the nation. And he has that line in his speech, our long national nightmare is over, written by Hartman. So Hartman objected to what they did, but he wrote the key line and actually fought Ford, who wanted to get rid of the line. Ford was on the fence about it, didn't think it was great, thought it was too stark. And Hartman says, this is the line you're going to be remembered for, and he's right. They are the most famous words Jerry Ford ever said. And they encapsulate what he did in that pardon. He put Watergate behind us in some ways, meaning that Nixon was no longer going to be tried and in the Klieg lights. But as we've discussed, and the fact that we're all here, Watergate never really got behind us as a nation. There were other fault lines that develop in the Ford administration. The most obvious is the, the, the tension between the Ford people and the Nixon people. I mean, they, there was a lot of rancor and Haig sort of at the, you know, at the center of a lot of the rancor. Can you talk about some of the other things in the Ford Fight House at this point? So I have this book, Fight House, that I wrote a couple of years ago about infighting in the White House. And if you would ask me when I started the book, which White House that I cover in the past, really, I was writing during the Trump administration, but I didn't have all the material on the Trump administration, you know, archives or oral history or anything, but when, which administration that I covered as a historian would have the most rancor. I would not have predicted the Ford White House. But yet, when I am asked in radio interviews which one had the most rancor, I invariably say the Ford White House. I mean, it was 895 days of, fight, of infighting. Um, and Hartman was at the heart of a lot of it. Uh, he really, generated a lot of anger and a lot of people disliked him. Uh, there was a line I had the book of, um, I think it was from David Gergen. It was possible to hate Robert Hartman, which I think is a great understatement. Um, but there's another line from, the, from an archivist who interviews Haig 30 years after the Ford administration is over. And he says that Haig turned red faced with anger at just the mention of Hartman's name. So Hartman was a challenging character. Uh, one of my favorite stories uh, was that in this early period when Haig is chief of staff, and he does not last long as chief of staff, in part because of Hartman uh, sticking the knife in him through, uh, through a constant series of leaks, but also in part through Haig being a difficult character who also got fired in the, in the Reagan administration. But at one point, Haig is walking in the West Wing, and he sees an aide to Hartman, not Hartman himself, but an aide to Hartman. And he grabs the aide by the collar. And remember, this, um, Haig's former military guy has some military bearing, he's going to be an opposing fellow. He grabs the guy by the collar and he says, listen, you tell that fat kraut, the kraut's a word for German and Hartman was of German descent. Uh, you tell that fat kraut that if he doesn't cut this stuff out, he's going to be leaving this place on a stretcher. <laughs> so not only physical violence against the guy, but a physical threat against Hartman, uh, which just shows you how angry uh, Hartman could, could make Hague. Uh, so th there was a lot of that going on in administration. Uh, after Hague leaves, Donald Rumsfeld becomes not the chief of staff, he becomes the staff coordinator, which is effectively the chief of staff, but they didn't, the word chief of staff had fallen out of favor with Nixon and uh, Haldeman, H.R. Haldeman, who was the chief of staff under Nixon, going to prison. So the chief of staff was kind of an unpopular <laughs> title. So Rumsfeld gets the staff coordinator title. And Rumsfeld brings in a young deputy named Richard Cheney, who becomes the deputy chief of staff and then later the youngest chief of staff in, in White House history. And they've got to figure out how to solve this problem of Hartman. Now Hartman is set up in the ante room of the Oval Office. I call it the Monica Lewinsky room for those who remember the Clinton administration. <laughs> but he's got, that's where he sits. I mean, he, his office is basically the, the room next to the Oval. He even shares the presidential toilet, which is the only aide I've ever read about who had access to the presidential toilet. Ford would let him use it. That's where the nice guy, Jerry Ford was. And with that access to the Oval Office, I think he abuses his geographic status in that he, if he sees something in the presidential inbox that he doesn't like, 
he will remove it from the inbox and leak it to Evans and Novak, who are the premier reporter in Washington. But if he has something that he wants to get in front of the president, he will slip it into the inbox without it going through the staffing process, without the staff secretary reviewing it, which is what happens to every single document that reaches the president must go through the staffing process, but not with Hartman around. And so Rumsfeld and Cheney have this conversation. What are we going to do about Hartman? I mean, he's sitting right there. He's using the presidential toilet. He's taking over the inbox. We cannot have this happen. And so they give it to Cheney to solve the problem. And Cheney goes to talk to the president. And Cheney had developed a reputation that Ford liked him because Ford uh, said to Rumsfeld, I like this Dick Cheney. He comes in, he talks about what he has to talk about, he gets the thing done, and he leaves. Which, you know, obviously a lot of people like their face time with the president, they want to stick around the president. Cheney just wants him to get stuff done. And so Cheney goes to see President Ford. He doesn't raise the issue of Hartman at all. He says, Mr. President, with all the things that are going on and all the challenges that you face and all the difficulties in the world, don't you think you need a place of quiet contemplation where you can think about these key issues and, and prepare for meetings and just, just be ready to be a leader by having some space where you can think? And Ford says, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. He likes that idea. And so Cheney, with that approval from the president, seals off the outside access to what was Hartman's office. So Hartman comes to work the next Monday and sees he no longer has a door to his office. And what was his office is now Ford's place of quiet contemplation. You're not going to take that away from the president. And Hartman was relegated to another office where he could do less mischief. Not no mischief, as we will see, but no less mischief. Well, let's go now. Um, let's, let's just go through the legacy of Watergate through subsequent administrations. So for example, the Carter administration, you've already mentioned that first movie that Carter is this movie fanatic in the White House. The first movie he sees is all the president's been. What are some of the other fallout, though? Well, the other, really, the, the, there's two key fallouts, I would say. Number one is, I mentioned this unpopularity of the concept of chief of staff. Carter is even more averse to the concept of chief of staff. He doesn't even have a staff coordinator who's actually the chief of staff, like Ford had with Rumsfeld. He doesn't have a chief of staff at all. He's adamant against having a chief of staff. And there's chaos in the White House as a result. And in fact, on the first day of the Carter White House, they're just sitting around and they don't know what to do. And this one, uh, one fellow in, in, uh, who's the, uh, the White House counsel says, um, well, maybe we should have a meeting. But he doesn't have the credibility and they, they don't have a meeting. And so they look to Ham Jordan, who's the young campaign strategist. And Jordan says, we'll have a meeting when I think we need to have a meeting, which isn't really an answer. And another uh, Carter White House, a guy named Michael Siegel, looks at this and he says, if only the KGB could see us now. <laughs> there was such disorganization and lack of understanding of a structure and how to make things happen. And so Carter becomes the chief micromanager of the Carter White House in the absence of a chief of staff. And uh, there's the famous story that he would even micromanage who got to use the White House tennis courts. And he would be rewriting pieces of legislation which led to one of his aides calling him the highest paid assistant secretary of housing and urban development, or urban development in history, because he was just getting involved in things that are not at the presidential level. And that's in part because he doesn't have a chief of staff. Now, eventually he recognized that he has a chief of staff, but he picks Jordan to be the chief of staff and Jordan by his own admission was not chief of staff material. It's just not what he did. He was a campaign strategist. And so that doesn't work out well. And then finally, they pick a guy named Jack Watson to be the chief of staff. Now, Jack Watson had chaired the transition for Carter and he did a good job, but as a result of having that job, he earned the enmity of Ham Jordan. This is something that is a kind of a recurring thing in presidential politics, which is the person who's on the campaign, the people who are on the campaign, they don't like the people who are on the transition. They set up a transition before you finish the campaign and the people on the campaign say, hey, we're here getting the president elected. And there are all these people divvying out the jobs in Washington that we should be earning and getting when, when we win, if and when we win. And so there's always tension between the people on the transition and the people on the campaign. But in this case, there was extra uh, tension in large part because Jordan and Watson didn't like each other. In fact, Watson made some joke about it. it took weeks before he was comfortable even turning the key in his ignition. He had so many enemies. 
But, um, but Watson should have been the chief of staff at the beginning. He's not. He's given the job towards the very end of the Carter administration. And Carter obviously loses that 1980 election. And during the transition period to Reagan, Reagan meets Watson and tells him, my people tell me that if you'd been chief of staff from the beginning, I wouldn't be here right now, recognizing that the lack, how the lack of chief of staff had really messed up the Carter administration. The second thing, uh, the, the second impact is we have the first new gate after words, uh, which is the scandal in which Burt Lance, who is Carter's chief uh, head of budget, the head of the Office of Management Budget, and a very close friend of, of Carter, who Carter spoke to six times a day, who Carter played tennis with regularly, because Carter must have scheduled those tennis games himself because he was in charge of the court. <laughs> uh, and Burt Lance is undone by the writings of New York Times columnist William Sapphire, a former aide to Nixon, who, by the way, left before Watergate, but still he's you know, associated because he was uh, he, he was a Nixon aide, and that's the really the first big scandal after Watergate, and it doesn't bring down the Carter presidency, but it does bring down Burt Lance's political career. And in retrospect, I think the historical record shows that Lance really hadn't done anything wrong. There was an appearance of impropriety, which really hurt him, and he did have to resign. But that loss of Lance, who was a key advisor to him, also hurts the Carter presidency. There's a sense that you go after someone for malfeasance and you go with both barrels full hog and you can really destroy lives. And that, that I think, unfortunately, is a legacy of Watergate as well. How about the legacy of, of Watergate and the Reagan administration? Reagan is the first Republican president elected after Watergate. And that administration is very afraid of this Watergate uh, title or of, of uh, having anything that is called Watergate. And uh, when Iran Contra emerges in the second term, they, uh, Reagan even writes in his diary, they're trying to make this another Watergate. And Don Regan, who's the chief of staff in Reagan's second term, says that um, we weren't even allowed to say the word water, Watergate. That's what kind of paranoia, what there was in fear of Watergate bringing down another presidency. But the first, uh, you know, I said Burt Lance was the first big scandal, the first big congressional investigative scandal hearings after Watergate are the Iran-Contra hearings, which I would say are, the, are kind of perhaps the last big bipartisan scandal hearings where both parties were kind of aligned and trying to figure out what happened and get at the truth. So after that, they became more partisan tests. But um, the, the Iran-Contra hearings are like the Watergate hearings in that they, they really rivet the nation and everybody's watching it. And uh, Oliver North you know, becomes such a figure that people want to get the Ali haircut, if you recall. So uh, I think that shadow hangs over the Reagan administration. And I actually have a, a great quote from uh, Reagan in his in the period, he was, uh, he knew Nixon, and he actually was in touch with Nixon during Watergate. And <laughs> there's a quote in the, um, in, in the archives where Reagan says to Nixon, we're behind, and he stops before saying we're behind you. <laughs> and then he just uh, adjusts and says something a little more banal and not too middle, because he knew it wasn't a good idea to say we're behind you to Nixon late in the Watergate scandal. So uh, Nixon was really something that every president uh, between, between Ford, from Ford through, um, through the first Bush, really are, are something they're running away from uh, because Nixon was so toxic because of Watergate. Is President Ford consulted at all about Watergate and the decision he made after you alluded to this earlier, Tevi? I believe it still stands that President Ford had the greatest, the most precipitous drop in approval in Gallup polling history on the night, basically after uh, he had pardoned Richard Nixon, so is it this, is it the shock of that, of course, it just really uh, disturbed the White House. So, considering what President Ford went through, were any of these subsequent presidents calling President Ford and asking, "Hey, you know, what should we do about some of these scandals, potential scandals?" I guess I've, I've never seen it. I've never seen anything where th that happened, where uh, Ford was regularly consulted. And this whole thing about presidents consulting their predecessors, it's, it's sporadic, let's put it that way. I mean, there's sometimes presidents are comfortable with it, and sometimes 
they're not. I mean, one of the most interesting ones, and in we talk about the legacy of, uh, of Watergate, is that I mentioned that all the presidents from Ford through Bush are kind of running away from Nixon. Uh, the first one who doesn't, in a way, is Bill Clinton, which is ironic because you know, he's the second Democrat elected after, after Water, Watergate. His wife works on the Watergate Investigative Committee, which in some ways is an inoculation. Nobody's going to accuse Clinton of being soft on Nixon because his, his wife worked on the committee. And then Clinton, in a way, gives Nixon what he wants most in the world, which is relevance on the world stage again. And Clinton reaches out to Nixon to get his foreign policy advice and guidance. And Nixon is so happy about this because no president is consulting him for this 20 year period afterward. He's, so, he's such a pariah. And in the last few years of his life, he, he dies two years into the, Nixon, into the Clinton administration. He gets to advise Clinton on foreign policy issues. And, and, he's, and you know, he's written more books about this issue and he's obviously a you know, geostrategic thinker and, and it makes him happy that he has that opportunity. We don't want to leave George H.W. Bush in case there's a good juicy story in there about 41. Well, I alluded to this earlier. I mean, 41 gets his kind of second political wind. I mean, he, he, he runs for Senate in Texas, loses, runs for House. If anyone in the booth wants to tell me what uh, to do about the mic, let me know. But um, it's, it goes off a couple of times. But he, he runs for uh, in Houston, wins, uh, and then he runs for Senate a second time, and he loses. So he loses two races for Senate, which sort of makes it seem like his political career is over. But he goes to Washington, and it's kind of resurrected by the Nixon administration, even though some Nixon aides are dismissive of him. And at one point, they, they say to him, you know, George, if you work, if you're going to work in administration, you're going to have to work hard. And um, Mrs. Bush finds that a very insulting and, and demeaning comment. And nobody ever suggested that, that George H.W. Bush uh, didn't work hard in politics, but he does come from a wealthy background and they, they thought he was sort of somewhat a feat. But he does, he works in a number of jobs in the Nixon administration, including head of the RNC, where I said, I said he writes that letter. Uh, saying that Nixon must go, which I think really salvages his future political viability. Uh, but without Nixon, really there is no George H.W. Bush because the thing he runs on in 1980, where he does very well, he becomes vice president, doesn't become president, is his amazing and sterling political resume and that he starts on that path with the RNC job and the um, uh, envoy to China and the CIA and the um, uh, the UN job, um, some of those are appointed by Ford, some by Nixon, but he really has started on that path by Nixon. So let's just moving along chronologically. Uh, I think now we're now 43, uh, your boss. So what is the uh, fallout for George W. Bush? Well, 43 is, um, uh, he's president and there's some uh, old Nixon slash Ford people in there, including uh, Rumsfeld and Cheney, who have big jobs in that administration. Rumsfeld is Secretary of Defense, making him both the youngest and oldest person ever to be Secretary of Defense in two different administrations. Cheney is obviously the Vice President, has huge impact on foreign policy, especially in the first term. But the Bush White House is a kind of leak-free zone. Leaks are very much frowned upon in the Bush White House, especially on the, the domestic side of the house, to the point where reporters complain about the lack of leaks coming from the White House. Now, you know, reporters are never happy. And in the Trump White House, they're kind of crowing, oh, look, there's so many leaks, what a messed up place. And in the Bush years, they're complaining, oh my gosh, not enough leaks coming here. So you know, the, the reporters are never gonna be fully happy. But Bush really does try and have a somewhat secretive administration. Cheney is behind a lot of this. He wants to be able to have uh, these um, uh, advisory groups that are that give private information to the president private advice, which I, I think the president should be able to have, but uh, he goes to the Supreme Court on, on this very issue and he does get the ability to have this energy committee advise him privately on you know, what's going on in, in the world of energy. But this penchant for secrecy in the administration <laughs> leads John Dean, who is obviously a character in the whole Watergate thing, to uh, I think falsely, perhaps preposterously, accuse the, the George W. Bush White House's secrecy efforts as worse than Watergate, which is that term kind of constantly recurring. We're always hearing about what, what, everything comparing to Watergate, which is why, again, I said it may not be the worst thing the president ever done, but it's certainly the most iconic scandal we've ever seen. 
So uh, the Bush administration is kind of tagged in, in, by John Dean, who you know, says credibility is a Watergate person in some eyes, and not lack of credibility is a Watergate person in other eyes, uh, but he, he calls it worse than Watergate. I thought that was interesting. And then the Obama administration, the legacy of Watergate. So I, I, um, I kind of tie Obama and Trump together in a, in a weird way, in that the whole Russia scandal that um, embroiled the, um, I guess, late Trump and, and most of the, late, late Obama and much of the Trump administration is a series of counter charges between two administrations. Obviously, the Obama folks while in the White House and then also after accused Trump of uh, improper ties with Russia and having a very weird relationship with Russia, which I, I think anyone could acknowledge that the relationship is a little weird and it's not clear what was going on there. Uh, but at the same time, Trump starts a lot of the ball rolling by accusing the Obama administration of tapping his phones. They, he said the phone tap and he says T-A-P-P, -P, he misspells it, which was a common tactic of his on Twitter to kind of show he was a regular guy, he, that he makes misspellings like everybody else, I guess. Um, because th this whole idea that Trump wrote all his, his own tweets is just not true. I mean, there was a team of people uh, who, who worked on the, the tweets and, and made them as <laughs> crazy and messed up as they were. Uh, and there was, there was one Washington Post article that suggested that uh, some of Trump's tweets that came from an iPhone were ones that Trump himself did and ones that came from another device were ones that were dra drafted by the staff. But when he, he does accuse them of tap, uh, of the, the phone tap T-A-P-P, uh, he says worse than Watergate. And so the, there's this, again, series of counter charges between the two administrations, and it obviously uh, culminates in the Mueller investigation, which Democrats thought was going to lead to an impeachment and doesn't lead to an impeachment proceeding. But ex almost as soon as the Mueller report comes out, which in some eyes exonerates him and in some eyes doesn't exonerate him, but as soon as Mueller kind of puts it behind us, meaning that there's going to be no impeachment from him, then the Zelensky call happens that same week. And it's that Zelensky call that leads to the first Trump impeachment, which uh, succeeds in the House and, fa and fails in the Senate, and was obviously one of two uh, Trump, Trump impeachments. So um, again, the, the, both the, the sense of Watergate and the series of uh, charges and countercharges between the two administrations, I think are, um, are kind of indicative of this overhang legacy uh, Watergate. And then obviously with the current administration, with, with Joe Biden, Biden is someone who's actually had a phone call between he and Nixon recorded on the White House tapes. You know, it's a relatively innocuous call. I mean, it's a, it a condolence call by Nixon to Biden because Biden uh, obviously had that tragic accident that killed his, his wife and, and child uh, right as he's about to become a senator. Um, and then there's also on the, on the White House tapes this, uh, this comment by Nixon calling, referring to Biden as a promising young politician. Did he know that uh, you know, 50 years later that promising young politician would be the president of the United States. So Watergate in its many, um, in its many legacies and overhangs and implications just continues to be something that comes up uh, with the presidency. And you know, it reminds me of the line from Faulkner in the, in the, um, in the South, the past isn't dead, it's not even past. And I think the same thing is true with Barton. One last question for me before we open it up to the floor, but I'd like to ask you, so Watergate is the most studied burglary by far in human history. There's more documentation, tapes, photographs, having to do with Watergate, study of the legacy than any other burglary. Of all the questions you asked about Watergate in the course of writing your, your book, I, well, you've written three or four books which somehow touch Watergate. What is the question that has not been answered to your satisfaction? Why? What? what? The, question, the question is why? Why did, why did this happen? Why did they bug the Democratic National Committee on the eve of an election that Nixon was going to overwhelmingly win? And I alluded to my thoughts on this, that perhaps um, that once the plumbers are established, they're just going to do you know, plumbers got a plum, as they would say today, and uh, they, they do those pl plumber type things. But it was so un. Heavy. Let me just just going to give you mine. The, the whole idea of the denials. Yeah. 
the whole idea of the denials by Nixon, um, I think I'm back now, but the, the denials by Nixon or the cover up uh, is just so unwise and just not effective. It didn't, it didn't work, it made things worse and is, thank you. Um, and, and it's really, it's, it's really more than the burglary itself. It's what destroys the presidency. So uh, I think the whys have never really been answered except in this. Nixon was a very insecure person and his insecurities drove everything he did. It drove his hatred of the media, it drove his creation of the enemies list, it drove his creation of the plumbers. And you could say, well, why didn't Nixon just let go? Why wouldn't he, why did he, didn't, why, you know, why didn't he just recognize he was gonna win that election? Because if, if he did, he wouldn't have been Nixon. And it's like people would say, well, if only Trump would stop tweeting, why doesn't he stop tweeting? He can't, because that's who he is. And that's so often the case with the, these presidents. You know, I, I, there's a story I love about Bill Clinton. 1974, so Bill and we're here in the, you know, right in the aftermath of Watergate and Bill Clinton wants to run for office. And he has this graduate student and political pro in Arkansas who starts bringing around with him to different meetings in Arkansas. And they are trying to win over the endorsement of some politically collect, connected lawyer. And they have this dinner and they're drinking and Clinton gets more and more slurry and less and less coherent as he drinks more throughout the evening. And at the end of the dinner, which was not a success because the lawyer did not endorse Clinton, he ended up endorsing Clinton's opponent, the graduate student slash political advisor says to Clinton, you can't hold your liquor enough to drink and do political stuff at the same time. And Clinton listens, Clinton stops drinking. And he really never drank in a serious way. Again, even though you know his father uh, or stepfather was an alcoholic who would you know, get in alcoholic rages and, and beat his mother. And there's that famous story when he's 14 that Clinton confronts his stepfather physically to tell him to stop, uh, stop abusing the mom. But Clinton, because his overwhelming ambition is able to stop his drinking. But Clinton, as we all know, has other challenges. And, <laughs> but seriously, he can't, he can't necessarily control himself though, even though he's warned. Um, Betsy Wright, who's one of his aides, says, you know, you're gonna mess this up because of your, you know, she, she said it very starkly, and I'm not gonna say the words she said, but you're gonna mess this up because of your behavior. Um, and he can't stop himself from that. But that, while it hurts his presence, he doesn't stop him from being president. Whereas drinking would probably have stopped him from his rise. And so when you're a politician, there, there are things you can control and and you know I'm a big fan in terms of just leadership and in um, success in your quest for success. There are things you can control, and there are things you can take care of, and there are things you can move past. But there are also part, parts of you that you can't move past, and you just have to recognize that you're they're part of your package. And Nixon's paranoia, Nixon's uh, inability to let things go, they were just part of his package, and that's why we're here 50 years later talking about Watergate. Questions from the floor. Yes, sir. President Ford um, had a conflict in, in his White House. Uh, how aware of that conflict was he and, and why do you think it was allowed to uh, happen? It's a great question. Uh, interesting phrasing that you had, why was it allowed to happen? Um, you know, I would use more passive tense. Why did Ford allow it? Uh, Ford was a nice guy. If anybody asks you what's what, what's Ford's uh, defining characteristics, I, I would say it's a nice guy. In fact, at one point in the preparation of the '76 re-election campaign, his aides kind of sit around and they say, "Well, we've got to come up with a strategy, an agenda, and a slogan for '76." And they ask Ford to just talk about himself. You know, tell us about you. And he said. I like people, which is a very nice thing, but it's not necessarily a defining uh, political slogan. And so Ford knows there's infighting in his White House. He doesn't like the infighting in his White House, but he also, as I was talking about some things, there are some things that you have in you that are innate that are part of you, you can't control. He was too nice a guy to really do the things that are required to address it. And in fact, Hartman, who I think was more Machiavellian and had a harsher sense of human nature. He said to Ford once, and everybody forgive my French in advance, the problem with you 
is that you don't distrust somebody's motives until they kick you in the balls three times. <laughs> it sounds like a lot, two more times than anybody else should tolerate. And because of that, Ford really didn't get things under control. And so even though Hartman has moved out of the monolithic Lewinsky room, as I suggested, he's not moved off the staff. He's still there causing the trouble that he causes. And the other people who are you know, uh, causing something, including a very young David Gergen, who was a sharp elbowed in fighter in four White Houses in the Nixon, Ford, Reagan, and Clinton administration. He was always causing trouble. He looks like a nice guy on CNN, but boy, <laughs> is he a tough uh, bureaucratic operator. Um, so Ford, I think, is just unwilling to do the things that were necessary that, to control the infighting that's happening around him. Next question. Yes, uh, Jason Thanks. Duncan, Aquinas College. Um, Dr. Troy, the media environment at the time, with like the movie today, the Post, you know, the Washington Post was crucial, but the rest of the papers and the networks were not known for being pro Nixon. I mean, he, you know, he was paranoid and, and insecure, but as the saying goes, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean there aren't people out to get you, right? So there was this fear of the media, the newspapers and the network were against them. Do you think that um, there's something to that? I mean, was Nixon treated fairly? Um, the movie, you know, the Post was trying to at least base it on facts and not slander him. Um, but I mean, there was this animosity that was there. It was obvious. And of course, today's media environment uh, is much different with Fox and the rest than the social media. But do you think, in, in your study of Watergate, that the main uh, media newspapers of the network were were you know, I don't know fair is the right word, but balanced uh, in Watergate in the coverage of Watergate? Look, I think it's safe to say the reporters didn't like Nixon that he wasn't popular and he had feuds with them going back for a long time. And I mean, we all know the, uh, the famous story in 62 when he loses the gubernatorial campaign for uh, in, in California after being vice president. And he gives that famous last press conference, it wasn't actually his last press conference, but it's called the last press conference, where he says, you won't have Richard Nixon to kick around anymore. Um, well, obviously they did get another chance to kick around Nixon uh, when, when he wins the election. But, but I, I do agree with what you're saying that the media are a little different today. I think there's much more of a sense of the narrative, capital T, capital N, where there are certain uh, presidents that they want to go after harder and certain presidents they, they take it uh, a little more easy on. Um, but that's just part of the environment. I mean, you have to recognize it. I remember uh, I worked with the Romney campaign in 2012 and Stuart Stevens, who was Romney's chief strategist, uh, was giving us a briefing on what's going on and somebody asked this question about media bias and how the reporters tend not to like uh, Republicans, which I, I think is generally true. Um, and he said, look, in presidential politics, you got to recognize that the media are the umpire and the Republicans are always the away team. But that doesn't mean you give up the game, right? You've got to find a way to win in that environment. And, you know, away teams win in basketball, football, baseball. I mean, they, they win all the time. You just have to recognize the, what the situation is and, and take advantage of it. And look, Trump, the reporters hated Trump. I mean, they really, they really hated Trump. Uh, but he also found ways to take advantage of it. I mean, he kind of weaponized their hatred against them uh, in ways that I think were not necessarily healthy for, for democracy, um, but in ways that galvanized his, his supporters. So uh, I think you just have to take it into consideration as part of the landscape. And you know, I, th I thought it was kind of interesting in the, in, in the movie today, and I'm not sure this is exactly accurate as it was happening. And they, they were suggesting that these two reporters at the Washington Post on the Metro desk, no less, uh, Woodward and Bernstein, were the only ones who were looking into Nixon, the only ones uh, who were kind of standing up against the, the rest of the media that was trying to be soft on Nixon. I, I don't think that, that was the case. I do think that they, were dogged and relentless in their pursuit of the story. But there were other important reporters who were looking into Watergate. And as obviously, as, as more revelations came out, there were, there were more reporters that did it. And, you know, in some ways, uh, you know, one of the themes of the movie is that they're, they're constantly in fear of being scooped by the New York Times, because the New York Times was looking into this as well. And in some ways, the Post and the Times 
were leading in this crusade because the, the other papers follow them. And if the Post and the Times have something, then the media has this herd mentality and, and they will follow. But they, they would, at the, in those days, certainly, they would often look to those papers to establish what was going on and then, and then follow them. There's also the case with the, the network news. I mean, the old joke was that you read an, an article in the New York Times on Wednesday morning, and then that is Dan Rather's lead in his Thursday night news. Um, that's it. The TV news uh, really follows the newspapers as well. So again, I, I think that the, the reporters didn't much like Nixon, but uh, Nixon also uh, gave a lot of rope to hang himself with. Next question. Yes, Dave Fry. Well, I, I got to say, I, I don't know. I don't think it's completely clear. I'm sure Garrett has some theories, but um, I, I think it's not fully established. Um, you know, I think uh, Howard Hunt is a, is, a, is a likely suspect, but nobody's really owning up and saying, hey, you know, I, I did it. Uh, but there are, you know, a, ver a variety of uh, nefarious characters who were into this kind of dirty trick stuff. And um, so. I've never seen anybody say that. I was the one who authorized it. I've never seen that. Another question. We have a question back. Let's let's get the microphone. So everybody watching at home, here, especially the people on watching uh, on Zoom. I'm just curious because we're here at the Ford Presidential Museum. Is this issue even addressed at the Nixon Presidential Museum on California? How does how do they deal with this really terrible episode in his presidency? I want Brooke to answer that question. I, I've been to the, the Nixon Museum, and it's weird. It's uh, you know, you've got this whole museum is celebrating Nixon and his accomplishments, and you've got the you know the. Um, you know, there's the house that uh, he grew up in, which is a very unimpressive house. And uh, uh, but you've got all this celebration, you know, the, the trip to China. I and mean, there's there's so much about Nixon that is really celebrated. And it just seems like there's this kind of room off to the corner that's in black. And it's just a kind of a, a separate room. Oh, yeah, there's this thing that happened called Watergate. But it really doesn't seem centrally integrated into the museum. Now, that's my perception from I went there a little while ago. And Brooke, would you agree with that? My, my assessment of that's how it looks. Uh, I went in the 90s. More integrated. Yeah, I saw the helicopter. So. Um, Abby, would you please provide a microphone? Thank you. So when the Nixon girls decided that they really wanted the Nixon Library to become part of the National Archives and Records Administration, the, the main thing that the archivist of the United States did at the time was say that we're happy to bring you into the fold and become a part of the presidential library system, but you will have to redo the Watergate exhibit that you have, a, you know, you'll actually have to acknowledge it. So um, there is a Watergate exhibit in their, their library, they do acknowledge it. Um, and that, that is how it became part of the National Archives too. Before that, it was definitely not integrated, though. <laughs> it was there, but just off to the side. Another question? Yes. I read something on the internet that the Nixon, what the White House, anyway, was putting out a statement regarding more uh, and, and it said that, uh, I didn't read the whole thing, but that there are new details which have not previously been made public. So I, I don't know if you've seen the statement yet, but it's it, it is in connection with the 50th anniversary. So, so I give a lot of talks and take a lot of Q&A and I'm always nervous when the question starts with I read something on the internet. <laughs> so <laughs> but um, but I, I've not seen that. So I, I don't know what uh, what, what they're going to reveal. But I 
you know, I'm waiting with bated breath to see what it might be. Well, I have one more follow-up question. Please, please. That 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 statement did come from the Nixon. It wasn't just okay, yeah. one of those wild things that appears on the internet. But uh, I know that um, there is a lot of question about who was responsible for the break-in, and uh, I just said he he stole my question, but. There is some stories floating around that John Dean was responsible for authorizing it because he felt that there was some information in the Democratic National Committee that it had something to do with his with his wife. Now, I mean that's been published. So, but it's. But, but you never hear much about that. I just wondered if if that if you looked into that at all. So I, I, I would say that um, I think ultimately Nixon was responsible for all of it. He set the things in motion that made it happen, even if he did not authorize it. Or you know, I bet you if they'd asked him the day before the burglary, right on a, on a June sixteenth, uh, nineteen seventy two, should we break into DNC headquarters? I bet he would have said no. But um, but I think he created the atmosphere in which it happened. And I, I don't know if we'll ever find out for sure who, who it was. Jack, you were there. I mean, you, you were serving in the Ford administration. And what, what were they saying within the Ford administration about the origin of this? Well, I, actually, I was uh, running the public affairs office at the Department of Justice during all of the Watergate investigation. And so we had our own speculation about how far it was going to get. But there was no question that Woodward and Bernstein, because of their relationship, uh, Woodward's relationship with Mark Felt, uh, he, he was being fed information that the Justice Department hadn't even been able to develop at that, at that point. And that's why the Washington Post kept breaking these sensational stories that and then now the FBI has got to scramble around and try to do the interviews to document what what Woodward and Bernstein were printing. So uh, we didn't at the Ford White House. I was a deputy press secretary in the Ford White House, and it really wasn't. I mean, Watergate really wasn't something that was discussed at all. I mean, it may have been in in exchange of conversation among some of the top aides but it was not something that that we were concerned about but may i ask as your job at the public affairs of justice was were you suspicious of felt as the potential source for for woodburton Bernstein? that is a funny question because uh i was with john mitchell so no, excuse me. I was because Mitchell was already running, was over running the campaign. I was with Dick Kleindienst, who became the Attorney General, and we were at some some place out, I think, like in Wyoming or Montana or somewhere. And a reporter asked me, "Who do you think was uh, Deep Throat?" And I said, "Well." Uh, I think I thought it could be either John Ehrlichman because he and and um, um, uh, Woodward played golf or played tennis together, or it was uh, Mark Felt. Anyway, the reporter, <laughs> of course, told a story. Now they immediately went over to Mark Felt and said, "What do you think about what?" what Hushin has said about you. He said, well, it's not me, it's actually him. <laughs> so, and I did get some questions about the fact that what is it possible for me to be the source of Woodward and Bernstein's information, but my credo at the Justice Department Public Information Office was, this is the Office of Public Information, this is not the Office of Leaks. So, I have to thank you. I never heard before that. That's an amazing thing that Ehrlichman and Woodward would play tennis together. That's really that's a that's a great fact. 
In fact, I've written a piece for Garrett when he was a Washingtonian about tennis playing at the White House and uh, the, the history of different presidents who played tennis and what uh, what, what they did in their fair in in uh, on the court and um, uh, you know Bush in in some ways. Um, uh, Bush met some of his top advisors because of uh, his, his love for tennis. And uh, Roger Porter was his domestic policy advisor and a terrific tennis player. And uh, he, he served in, in that administration. And, and uh, Ford would play tennis with Rumsfeld. Uh, so there's a, there's a great rich history of uh, tennis playing in, in the White House, but I did not know that uh, Wood, Woodward and uh, Ehrlichman played. I'm going to incorporate that in the future. Thank you. By the way, that could. Yeah, but that could never happen today, right? I mean, a top Washington Post reporter and the domestic policy advisor, certainly in a Republican White House, I just don't, I can't imagine that happening. One more question. Back there, Dave. Why did they need five burglars to pull this thing off? Why did they need any? I mean, were they just riding around drinking and saying? Hey, well, I mean, the, the, the truth is that uh, they, they were uh, implanting um, listening devices, right? So, you, you know, they, they were trying to hit more than one phone and just, you know, you, you wanted to cover the area. And if also, if you're looking for information, you want to divide it up. And look, they, they didn't think that they would be caught and they did have overwatch. So someone was supposed to warn them if somebody was coming and, you know, maybe they shouldn't have taped that door. But um, uh, the, uh, you know, five, you know, it's, it's what was Henry V say, you know, if we're, uh, if we're to die, we are too many, and if we're going to win, we are too few. So, uh, you know, the, I think the, 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 the number was a problem. If, if they got caught, the number was a problem, no matter what. Let's give Tevi Troy a hand. A what, what's that? Well, there was one more question. The there one more question. Okay. One more question. Yes, sir. Um, Jacob. That's a, a terrific question. Thank you. I started my book, Fight House, at the very beginning of the Trump administration because all I heard about was all this fighting in the White House. It's unprecedented, unprecedented. Whenever I hear the word uh, unprecedented as a presidential historian, I look for precedents. And I listened to an interview with Peter Robinson, who is a White House speechwriter under Reagan, and he's um, the, the, fame, the he author of the famous words, Tear Down This Wall. And in this interview, that was just as I was writing my book proposal for White House, he said, of course we had fighting in the Reagan administration. We just didn't have tweeter, Twitter, twatter talking about it. And so, yes, you're absolutely right that there's more attention paid to it these days with the um, reporters and kind of um, immediate access, whether it be a social media or uh, quicker publication timelines. And there's even more interest in it, it seems to me, in Republican administrations than Democratic administrations because of the way the, the, the press is. Uh, so it was, there, there was less focus on it by the media. And, and most of my research in the Ford, uh, in, in my Ford chapter did not come from uh, immediate journalistic hits, but from the memoirs, the oral histories, the material in the, in the Ford archives. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, so, but whereas in the Trump administration, I was telling Gleaves earlier that I have a file of in, about infighting in the Trump White House. I have one about infighting in every White House because that's just what I do. But my, my file of Trump infighting stories that come mostly from journalistic accounts, because we don't have the oral histories yet. We obviously don't have a professional historian works on it yet, although we do have some memoirs and there's some memoir in that Trump file is over 550 pages. So I, and, you know, and I have a Biden file. It's no longer nowhere near 550 pages. I have an Obama file. It's certainly not that long, Bush file. Uh, but uh, Trump, I, you know, if, I, if I do have to write something about the Trump administration infighting and, and you know, an isolated thing, I'm going to have to budget a lot of time just to go through the file to see what I have. So it's, it's an excellent question. Thank you. All right, let's give, very good, Tevi, give him a hand. Tevi, thanks for a wonderful presentation and great conversations, very amenable to a lot of different questions. It's intimidating, I think, to be in a, 
uh, stage with in the audience, we've got people who are actually sources. I mean, Jack, you you were there in the administration. Hillary, you uh, certainly knew Ford quite well, and so you did a great job coming to the hometown and actually teaching us something, and I really appreciate that. Well, can I just say thank you to Gleaves and to um, Brooke and to the entire staff uh, who've really done a great job of making me feel welcome. I'm so appreciative of all your efforts, and I'm appreciative to all of you in the audience who came out tonight and all of those in Zoom world who are watching as well. Thank you.